opening the door to the building of the third Jewish temple. Some called it a kiss from heaven. Unveiling strange phenomena upon its completion. Join us today as we delve into a prophetic shift that transpired with the reclaiming of the Temple Mount by Jewish hands, paving the way for the construction of the Third Jewish Temple. This monumental event holds the key to biblical prophecy, signaling the awaited return of Jesus Christ to Earth. As we peer into the unfolding events in Israel, one significant anticipation looms large, the erection of the Third Temple. This sacred site, destined for worshiping God in Jerusalem, holds profound significance in biblical history and the future foretold. Since the destruction of the Second Temple in 70 AD, the question has lingered. Will a new one rise? Today, we explore this question as we delve into the realm of Bible prophecy, the anticipation of certain end-time events, as referenced in Daniel 12. One often intertwines with discussions about the prophesied Third Temple, to grasp the significance of this future edifice, it's essential to delve into the narrative surrounding the first two temples in Jerusalem. The temple saga commences with King David's aspiration to erect a grandiose structure to honor God. However, God, appreciative yet declined David's proposal, expressing contentment with a humble tent for the time being. Earlier, God had instructed the Israelites to fashion a portable tabernacle for worship during their wanderings. Despite God's refusal, he assured David of a perpetual lineage to oversee his affairs, ensuring that one of David's descendants would eventually construct a dwelling for him. Following God's plan, Solomon, David's heir, undertook the monumental task of erecting what would be renowned as the House of the Lord upon Mount Moriah in Jerusalem. This sacred abode served as the focal point of Israel's worship for approximately four centuries from its inauguration by Solomon until its devastation by the Babylonians in 586 BC, a tragic event chronicled in 2 Kings 25. 9. The Temple Mount resides in Jerusalem, spanning approximately 36 acres atop Mount Moriah, a site of profound historical importance. In Genesis 22, 2 and 4, Abraham was instructed to journey there to offer his son Isaac as a sacrifice laying the foundation for its sacred significance. Later, King David acquired a threshing floor from Ornan at this site, where, after receiving a divine response, he declared it as the house of the Lord God and the altar of burnt offering for Israel. 1 Chronicles 21, 18, 30, 22, 1. Mount Moriah holds a pivotal role in the initiation of Solomon's construction of the temple in Jerusalem. 1 Chronicles 22, 1, 19. This location, often referred to as Zion, was specifically chosen by God as His dwelling place, with a vow to establish His name there eternally. For centuries, the belief in Israel's eventual return to its ancient homeland and the reconstruction of the Temple has been deeply ingrained within Christian and Jewish communities. Rooted in biblical prophecies, this conviction has stirred the hearts and minds of believers, prompting a thorough examination of scriptures for clues and signs of fulfillment. Though not always explicit, biblical texts offer three indications of another temple's existence, with two pointing to a literal temple, while the third holds symbolic significance. This anticipation of the temple's reconstruction symbolizes a profound spiritual longing and serves as a beacon of hope for believers across generations. According to prophecies found in the book of Daniel, sacrifices will cease in the end times. There's a belief among some that the Jews will construct a new temple in Jerusalem before the return of Jesus Christ to earth. However, the construction of a third temple by the Jews on the Temple Mount is a subject of dispute and a major point of conflict between Arabs and Israelis. Presently, the Dome of the Rock, an Islamic sanctuary, stands on the site of the Second Temple, alongside the Al-Aqsa Mosque, another Islamic structure on the Temple Mount. While some anticipate the Jewish construction of another temple before Christ's return, others speculate that sacrifices may resume without the physical temple akin to the practices observed before the Second Temple's erection. In Ezra 3.11.26, we find a historical precedent where, 
Despite not having a temple foundation laid, the Jewish people built an altar to offer burnt offerings. They followed the law of Moses, maintaining the traditions and rituals, celebrating the Feast of Booths, and offering the required daily burnt offerings, new moon offerings, and festival offerings, including voluntary offerings to the Lord. This passage illustrates the commitment of the Jewish people to uphold their religious practices even in the absence of a temple structure. They prioritized obedience to God's commandments and sought to honor Him through sacrificial offerings, demonstrating their faithfulness and devotion. Similarly, in contemporary discussions about the potential reconstruction of the temple, some envision a scenario where sacrifices resume on an altar without the necessity of a complete temple structure. This interpretation suggests a flexible approach to fulfilling religious obligations while navigating complex geopolitical realities and religious sensitivities surrounding the Temple Mount. The desire to restore temple worship reflects a deep-seated religious longing among certain Jewish communities, intertwined with eschatological expectations of the end times. However, the practical challenges and political tensions surrounding the Temple Mount pose significant obstacles to the realization of these aspirations, underscoring the complexities inherent in any attempts to redefine the sacred landscape of Jerusalem. In the book of Ezekiel, chapters 40 to 48 present Ezekiel's profound vision of a magnificent temple, offering intricate details that have sparked considerable speculation and diverse interpretations throughout history. Born into the priestly line, Ezekiel served as a prophet of God, delivering his message during a tumultuous period before the Babylonians destroyed Jerusalem and its temple in 586 BC. Prior to the city's destruction, false prophets falsely reassured the people of God's unwavering protection, while true prophets like Jeremiah and Ezekiel solemnly warned of impending judgment. Ezekiel, exiled to Babylon, likely during the second deportation of Jews in 597 BC, continued his ministry, offering encouragement to Israel amidst their exile. He prophesied that God's judgment would not endure forever and assured them of restoration, with God once again dwelling among his people. Ezekiel's vision of the Valley of Dry Bones symbolizes Israel's resurrection, portraying a vivid image of national restoration and rejuvenation. Moreover, in chapters 38 and 39, Ezekiel prophesies a climactic battle between Israel and its enemies, symbolized by Gog and Magog, culminating in Israel's victory. The heart of Ezekiel's vision lies in chapters 40 to 48, where he meticulously describes the construction and rituals of a grand temple. In the 25th year of Israel's captivity, Ezekiel envisions the return of God's glory to the temple symbolizing divine presence and favor. Sacrificial offerings are reinstated, signifying renewed covenantal worship and communion with God. Detailed descriptions of the temple's layout and rituals underscore the meticulousness of Ezekiel's vision, emphasizing the centrality of worship and obedience to God's commandments. Symbolically, the restored temple signifies Israel's spiritual renewal and recommitment to God's covenant. Ezekiel's prophecy extends beyond Israel's restoration, envisioning a transformed society where hearts are changed and even Gentiles are included in God's kingdom. This vision of spiritual renewal and inclusivity reflects Ezekiel's profound understanding of God's redemptive plan for his people. In conclusion, Ezekiel's vision offers a glimpse into God's ultimate purpose for Israel and the world, emphasizing restoration, renewal, and divine presence. As believers reflect on Ezekiel's prophecy, they are reminded of God's faithfulness, sovereignty, and enduring promise of redemption. In Ezekiel's visionary account of the temple, he finds himself transported to Israel, where he encounters a mountain and a city. Approaching the scene, he encounters a figure resembling bronze, standing in the gateway, holding a linen cord and a measuring rod. This figure instructs Ezekiel to pay close attention to what he sees and hears, emphasizing the importance of conveying these details to God's people. Ezekiel's vision includes intricate measurements and designs of the temple complex, raising questions about whether this vision should be interpreted literally or symbolically. 
Some believe that the vision represents God's future perfection among His people, either already fulfilled or yet to come. The debate over the literal or symbolic nature of prophecy and its fulfillment leads interpreters to consider various scenarios for the fulfillment of Ezekiel's temple vision, including during the Church Age, the Millennium, or the Eternal State. Proponents of a literal fulfillment point to the detailed descriptions and measurements in Ezekiel's vision, suggesting that if taken literally, its fulfillment must be in the future. The temple dimensions outlined in Ezekiel far surpass the grandeur of the temple during Jesus' time, leading many to anticipate its construction during the Millennial Kingdom, when Christ reigns on earth for 1,000 years. During this time, glorified saints are believed to coexist with natural humans, some of whom will accept Christ while others reject Him. However, the sacrificial system described in Ezekiel poses a theological challenge, as Christ's sacrifice is seen as the ultimate atonement for sins. Hebrews 10 underscores this, stating that the repeated sacrifices of the law cannot take away sins. In this view, Ezekiel's sacrifices may symbolize memorials of Christ's sacrifice or ceremonial cleansing rather than forgiveness of sins. Alternatively, a figurative interpretation of Ezekiel's temple vision sees it as symbolizing God's restored relationship with His people, with the Messiah replacing the temple, sacrifices, and land. In this view, the presence of God is manifested through the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, leading to a deeper intimacy between God and His people. Regardless of the interpretive approach taken, Ezekiel's vision assures believers that God has not forsaken His people and promises a restored and elevated relationship with them. This vision speaks to the unchanging faithfulness of God, even in challenging circumstances. Shifting to the discussion of the East Gate in Jerusalem, historical records challenge common assumptions about its significance in biblical prophecy. Contrary to the belief that the gate has always been open, records indicate its predominantly closed status throughout history, opening only on rare occasions. This realization prompts a reassessment of its role in biblical narratives, particularly those involving Jesus and the temple events. Further exploration of the Third Temple and its implications invites a deeper examination of biblical prophecy and its relevance to contemporary understandings of faith and history. As we shift our focus beyond the East Gate, our attention is drawn to the broader inquiry into the temple's historical location. While conventional beliefs suggest complete obliteration, 2 Chronicles 3, 1 offers a revelation that the temple was constructed on the threshing floor of Aruna. This revelation sparks an investigation into the significance of threshing floors, typically located outside city walls for agricultural purposes. A compelling hypothesis arises, suggesting that the Temple Mount, positioned above the city of David, could potentially correspond to the location of this ancient threshing floor, and thus, the Temple itself. The presence of a vast, flat expanse of bedrock atop the Temple Mount mirrors the characteristics of a threshing floor, lending credence to this theory. Yet, frustration mounts as proposed. Temple locations fail to definitively identify the threshing floor as a defining landmark. This frustration underscores the complexity of reconciling archaeological evidence with biblical narratives and historical accounts, highlighting the challenges inherent in unraveling ancient mysteries, where interpretation and speculation often cloud definitive conclusions. The quest for truth embodied in this exploration reflects a broader human endeavor to understand our past, reconcile it with the present, and shape our collective future. The history of the Temple Mount in Jerusalem, particularly the area associated with the city of David and the Temple, is deeply intertwined with biblical narratives and archaeological findings. According to biblical accounts, King David purchased a threshing floor outside the city, which was still owned by the Jebusites at the time. This transaction not only symbolized David's assertion of Jerusalem as the capital of Israel, but also marked the beginning of the city's transformation into a religious center. The complex history of Jerusalem includes periods of conflict and coexistence between Israelites and Jebusites. While some Jebusites resisted Israel's establishment as a nation, others chose to remain and were allowed to inhabit the land. 
This nuanced interaction sheds light on the geographical layout of the area, particularly the location of Mount Moriah, which lay outside the confines of the city of Salem, as Jerusalem was known in ancient times. Central to this historical narrative is the identification of a significant landmark, a large flat piece of bedrock on the Temple Mount, situated beneath the Dome of the Spirits. This bedrock is believed to be the very threshing floor purchased by King David, a pivotal site in the establishment of Jerusalem as a religious and political capital. Its inclusion in the platform of the Temple Mount suggests that it served as the starting point for the construction of the Temple itself. The significance of this bedrock extends beyond its historical association with King David. It serves as a tangible link between biblical accounts and archaeological evidence, providing a concrete reference point for understanding the layout and construction of ancient Jerusalem. Moreover, its centrality within the Temple Mount complex underscores its sacred importance, serving as a focal point for religious rituals and commemorations. The history of the Temple Mount and the iconic Dome of the Rock encompasses a rich tapestry of religious significance, cultural transitions, and archaeological investigations. Following the destruction of the Second Temple in 78 AD, the Temple Mount underwent a series of transformations that left indelible marks on its landscape and identity. After the fall of Jerusalem, control of the Temple Mount passed through various hands, eventually coming under Byzantine rule. It was during this period that the Byzantines relinquished control to the Muslims, who encountered a significant uh. The deliberate dedication of the Temple Mount to Jupiter marked a significant act of desecration, further complicating its already tumultuous history. The architectural features of the Temple Mount, particularly the prominent piece of bedrock beneath the Dome of the Rock, have been subjects of intense scrutiny and debate. While traditionally identified as the threshing floor, some argue that its irregular shape and size do not align with scriptural descriptions. Instead, it is proposed that this bedrock has undergone cycles of destruction and reconstruction, with successive temples being built and destroyed upon its foundation. This narrative of destruction and rebuilding gains support from the discovery of architectural elements corresponding to descriptions of the Golden Gate in prophecy. Such findings suggest the possibility of remnants of previous temples lying hidden beneath the surface, awaiting discovery through diligent archaeological investigation. The Golden Gate in Jerusalem holds immense historical significance, steeped in religious tradition and archaeological intrigue. Believed by some to be the original Eastern Gate of the Second Temple, its purported authenticity is supported by a wealth of evidence and scholarly scrutiny. Despite challenges from archaeologists arguing that the Dome of the Rock is the actual temple location, the speaker emphasizes the importance of Jewish tradition and oral history, asserting that the gate was in line with the temple. This reliance on scripture as a reliable source underscores the speaker's conviction that all scriptural accounts hold equal weight in understanding historical truths. Of particular significance is the alignment between the Golden Gate and the threshing floor in Jerusalem, a correlation deemed highly improbable to be mere coincidence. Statistical analysis yields a remarkably low probability of 7%, adding a quantitative dimension to the mounting evidence, supporting the gate's historical significance. Addressing objections to this theory, including claims of the 10th Legion's presence on the Temple Mount, the speaker invokes scripture and historical records to counter such assertions. Scriptural references indicate the presence of only a cohort, not a legion, in Jerusalem before the Temple's destruction, a fact corroborated by Roman records. Moreover, the deployment of legions to Jerusalem was primarily for suppressing revolts, rather than maintaining peace supporting the notion that the Temple Mount retained its religious significance despite Roman occupation. Compelling archaeological evidence indicates the presence of the Roman 10th Legion on the Temple Mount post-destruction of the Second Temple, marking a significant chapter in the site's history. Contrary to the notion that the Temple Mount was repurposed as a Roman fortification, its size and construction techniques suggest it was originally built before Roman intervention. 
The absence of significant alterations to accommodate military structures supports the assertion that the Temple Mount retained its original purpose as a religious center. The presence of the East Gate, notably omitted from Nehemiah's account of the Temple's restoration, serves as pivotal evidence supporting continuity with the First Temple period and the original location of the Temple complex. Regarding the sources of water for Temple sacrifices in Jerusalem, popular beliefs about the exclusive reliance on the Jihan Spring are challenged. Instead, evidence suggests a diverse water management system, including aqueducts from the Pools of Solomon and the Damascus Gate. These systems fed into complex networks underneath the Temple Mount with significant holding capacity. The argument extends to the Temple's elevation relative. From the present-day platform for the Dome of the Rock beneath the Temple Mount in Jerusalem lies evidence of an ancient water system that speaks volumes about the ingenuity of past civilizations. With water sources originating from below, it is suggested that the Temple must have been situated at a lower elevation. The functionality of the systems operating as mikvah with continuous freshwater circulation supports this assertion and confirms a reliable source of fresh water on the Temple Mount. This system, complete with an aqueduct capable of filling the systems below the sacred site, showcases a remarkable understanding of hydraulic engineering essential for sustaining life in the bustling city above. The revelation that the Ark was brought from the City of David to the Temple Mount after its completion adds a layer of religious and ceremonial significance to this underground network. It underscores the deep reverence and importance attached to the Temple Mount throughout history, reaffirming its status as a central hub of worship and spiritual significance. Moreover, the comparison of the weathering on the Golden Gate to other stone monuments from the Second Temple period prompts a reconsideration of the age and origins of this iconic structure. By challenging conventional assumptions, this comparison encourages a more nuanced understanding of Jerusalem's architectural history and the narrative surrounding its landmarks. Similarly, the skepticism surrounding the temple's purported proximity to the Al-Aqsa Fountain prompts a re-evaluation of traditional interpretations of historical texts and archaeological findings. The absence of suitable ground for a temple in that area underscores the importance of considering multiple perspectives and thoroughly examining all available evidence when reconstructing the past. Analogies drawn between illusionist David Copperfield's famous trick of making the Statue of Liberty disappear and the potential misinterpretation of historical sources serve as a cautionary reminder against blindly accepting narratives that seem to contradict established beliefs. Just as turning the audience's attention away from the statue creates the illusion of its disappearance, selective interpretation of evidence can distort our understanding of historical truths. The significance of the Temple Mount is deeply ingrained in religious history and belief systems worldwide. It is revered as the place where God chose to establish His Temple, a symbol of divine presence and connection for countless followers. Amidst discussions about the construction of a grand temple for ancient rituals, like the Red Heifer Sacrifice or the Abomination of Desolation, the Temple Mount holds a unique and enduring importance. Central to its significance is its association with Jesus Christ, whose teachings and actions are intertwined with its history. According to Christian tradition, Jesus walked and spoke on the Temple Mount, imparting wisdom to His disciples and challenging religious norms of the time. His prophetic words about the Temple's destruction are often interpreted as a metaphorical dismantling of religious orthodoxy, underscoring the transient nature of material structures compared to spiritual truths. Jesus Christ occupies a central role in human history, believed by Christians to be God incarnate who came to redeem humanity from sin. His life, death, and resurrection are seen as pivotal events that offer a pathway to reconciliation with God and the promise of eternal life. The belief in Jesus as Lord and Savior is proclaimed as the means of salvation, emphasizing the universality of divine grace and forgiveness. In this sacred moment, we come before you with open hearts and eager minds, seeking your wisdom and guidance as we embark on the journey of understanding your word, the Bible. You are the source of all knowledge and truth, 
and we humbly ask for your enlightenment to illuminate our minds and souls as we delve into the depths of your holy scriptures. Grant us, O Lord, the gift of discernment, that we may perceive the hidden truths and timeless messages woven within the pages of your word. Help us to see beyond the words on the surface and to grasp the profound meaning behind each verse and passage. Let your spirit be our guide, leading us into all truth and opening our hearts to receive your divine revelation. Teach us, O God, to approach your word with reverence and humility, recognizing that it is a sacred gift given to us for our instruction and edification. May we read it with reverence, study it with diligence, and meditate on it day and night, that we may be transformed by its power and renewed in our minds and spirits. Grant us the grace to embrace the complexities and paradoxes of your word, understanding that your ways are higher than our ways, and your thoughts are higher than our thoughts. Help us to wrestle with difficult passages and to seek understanding with sincerity and perseverance, knowing that your truth will ultimately prevail. As we embark on this journey of understanding your word, may your presence be ever near, comforting us in times of confusion, inspiring us in times of doubt, and guiding us in times of uncertainty. For in your word, we find hope, joy, peace and life everlasting. In your holy name we pray, amen.